Hello students, I would like to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and in particular to point out some of the details of the text that might not be immediately apparent at first. So to dig into what's really going on there because the details are important. The first thing I'd like to note is the existence of these passion narratives themselves. So passion from the Latin word passio meaning to suffer. And so the, the, the passions in the Gospels, each Gospel ends with a detailed account of Christ's sufferings. And this is something new that there is no, uh, in the ancient world, there is no parallel to this. You know, there were lots of biographies. Christians didn't invent biographies by any means. But this idea that, you know, you would spend a couple of chapters, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 chapters talking about Jesus' life, and then you might spend uh, several more chapters focused on the last 48 hours of his life on earth or 72 hours of his life on earth. Um, that was unique in that they would give so many details of, of the passion and the trial and the crucifixion and who was there and what was said. Again, we, we have detailed stories about Jesus from earlier in the Gospel, but they're taking like this kind of broad narrative view. They're just picking out a few key, key miracles. But all of them end with this detailed look at the suffering and death of Christ. And so what we're encountering here in the Gospels is something that's new in literature. Normally, it, it, that this was not really seen before. So there's something about the passions that's worth paying attention to. The details that are included are, are included for a reason. Now, in the Passion Narratives, one of the details are is the drinks that are offered to Jesus. And Matthew 27 and Mark 15 will note something along the lines of, they gave him vinegar to drink mixed with gall. Uh, Mark will use a different word, myrrh, there. But they both mean basically the same thing, the two different ways of kind of referencing the same idea. And when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. Okay. All right, so we've got that as one instance of a drink being offered. And then in John, we hear the particular phrase, I thirst. Okay, and then after that, later on in, in Matthew, we get the, the phrase, Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. So Jesus is crying out uh, to God the Father, and they think, well, maybe he's calling on Elijah. So they give him this sponge with sour wine. Okay. So why? Like, why include these details? You know, the, the Gospels spend, uh, none of them is, is 33 chapters long, and yet they're, they're covering 33 years of Christ's life. Why focus on these details at the end of his life? And the, the fact is that the drinks are not random, that they're two different drinks. They're not referring to the same thing, and they do two different things. Okay, so now here's the key idea. The first drink, the one that Jesus rejects before he's crucified, was one traditionally given by the Romans to the subjects of crucifixion. And it was a drug, basically. And you'd give it to people so that they could endure the crucifixion a little bit more easily. Kind of a, a little bit of, of mercy mixed in with, you know, crucifixion, which is kind of gruesome torture. And Jesus rejects that. Then they offer him a second uh, drink, which is the sour wine. And this was a drink that was known in the ancient world. And there, some people think, oh, it was just a cruel joke or something like that. But there are no other e references in ancient literature to someone being given a sour wine as, a, as a joke. It was always given as a refreshing drink, something that quenched the thirst better than water alone. And so uh, Jesus tastes it and, and gets some in his mouth and it, um, it allows him, in a sense, to be even more aware, not less. So the first drink is meant to dull, and he rejects it. The second drink is to refresh him or invigorate him, and he takes it. Okay. Um, and so the, the question would be, why? Well, it's all part of God's love for us, that you know he doesn't want to dull the pain of his crucifixion, that he wants to fully enter into his passion out of love for us. And that in taking the second drink, it allows him, uh, allows us to kind of hear him more clearly uh, and him to be more present and, and to say what he needs to say in a way that can be heard. So that's the first little detail, the drinks offered to Jesus. Now, looking at some of the last words, we're not going to go through all of them, but just some of the la phrases used by God, by Jesus on the cross. There's the famous one, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And in one sense, we might ask, well, how, how could Jesus say this? And, and the first thing he's, you have to remember, he's the innocent one being slain for the guilty. And 
part of what he's doing is he's standing in our place and, and there's this sense of God's absence in our world and sinful humanity. Why? Because we're separated from God. And why are we separated? Because he doesn't love us anymore? No, because we've sinned. And so Jesus gives voice to that. But you're not going to get this phrase unless we take into account something else. That when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He not, he's not just speaking on our behalf, but he's also articulating a hope for the future. You might say, what? How is that hopeful? Well, the line that he speaks is not hopeful, but it's the opening of Psalm 22, which is a long psalm. But if you read Psalm 22, it ends with hope and triumph. It does not end in despair. And so when Jesus is on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Yes, he's giving voice to how we may sometimes feel, to how things look when he's on the cross, how things may seem to everyone else. But he's really saying something profound about what's going on in his heart, which is that he's still hoping in the Father and in triumph through his power. Okay. Another sort of key last phrase here is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Very powerful moment on the cross. And it's an example of Jesus' perfect love in two ways. First, that he forgives his tormentors, and secondly, he even acts as their defense attorney, and he makes what excuses he can for them. They don't know what they're doing, Father. In one sense, it's true that we never really know what we're doing. We never really fully grasp the evil of sin, at least not in this life. And so Jesus tries to plead for his tormentors. That's such as the depth of his love. And the last phrase I want to look at is from the Gospel of John. It is finished. This is the last thing he says in John's Gospel. Now, what exactly is finished? Well, several things he could be referring to in a sense. So first, obviously, his suffering. Like shortly after he says that, he gives up his spirit. But that suffering that he's been undergoing is the crucial work that he does for the sake of our redemption, for the sake of our salvation. And so dying in one sense, he's, uh, he's completing the sacrifice uh, necessary uh, for our redemption. So, so what we need to be saved is being finished. That brings us to the third thing, the paschal sacrifice. Um, so not just its effect on us, our redemption, but what is it that he's actually doing? And we've talked about how at the normal Passover meal there were four cups that were drunk, and yet in the accounts of the Last Supper it says that the apostles, they drank the third cup, and then they sang a hymn, which should have been followed by a fourth cup, and there is no fourth cup. And Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. And what is that fourth cup? What is the cup that he wants to pass? The suffering the suffering that he endures. That's the fourth cup. And in drinking the fourth cup, the new Passover is completed. So what Jesus is saying is that it, it is finished, that, that he has drunk fully from the fourth cup. He's drunk the suffering to the very dregs, and now it's finished. There is a new Passover. There is a new uh, lamb that takes away uh, that takes away sin, that saves from death. And it's himself. It's his own blood. And so in going through his suffering to the very end, Jesus has drunk the fourth cup and he has completed the new Passover sacrifice.